great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done. In greater rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be. No wonder our transport when Jesus we see. And now, would you join me in our call to worship? Would you please stand as we say it? One step on the Lenten path. Drawing closer to God. Seeing the errors we've made. Knowing more about ourselves. Trusting in God's embrace. And now would you enjoy, join me in our Lenten Creed. We believe that our lives are held within the encircling love of God, who knows our names and recognizes our deepest needs. We believe that Christ is the divine child of the living God, and that his grace is like living waters that can never be exhausted. We believe in the birthing, renewing, enabling spirit of God who yearns over our welfare as a mother yearns for her child. We believe that God is in the arid desert as well as in green pastures, and that hard times and discipline are also loving gifts. We believe that our journey has a purpose and a destination and that our path leads to a human glory we cannot yet imagine. We believe that in the church we are fellow pilgrims on the road and that we are called to love one another as God loves us. This is our faith and we are humbled to profess it in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. This week, as we come to our time of prayer, I want to draw our attention to the milestone that was achieved in our country of half a million, 500,000 people who have died from COVID. And in Florida, 30,000 people. It's hard, we hear those numbers, don't we? And it's like, okay, that's a lot. But let me give you perspective. A half a million would be the same as the city of Atlanta. So that means that area is wiped out. For Florida, 30,000 is Sebastian and Roseland. Gone. When we hear about it, and you may know people who have died from COVID. And so you have an immediate face that goes with one of those numbers. We've been very fortunate in this church. We have not lost any members to COVID. I can't say the same for a lot of my clergy friends. When I talk to them, they'll tell me we lost another to COVID, another. We've been very fortunate here. But it reminds us that there are people hurting all, in, all around our country. There are empty places at tables. There are voices no longer heard in families. And so today, we remember and we mourn with them. And so as we begin our time of prayer, I would invite us to begin with a, a moment of silence for you to pray, if you know somebody that has died of COVID, to 
to pray for their family or to pray, pray for people just in general, mourning everywhere. Let us pray. Oh Lord, in this time of silence, we remember. We remember lives that have been lost. We remember families devastated. We remember that there are just people and communities reeling from this virus. And we remember maybe somebody that we know personally. And Lord, we pray that your arms of comfort and strength are everywhere in families, in people just feeling alone, that your compassion and your love is felt as they grieve, as they try to figure out what a new normal looks like. We pray, Lord, that that you continue to be with the doctors and the researchers and so many people in ways that we can, can eradicate this virus. We pray for the caregivers, those that are just weary, so weary. Give them your strength, Lord. And we pray for our communities. We pray that we can truly be hopeful in the midst of pain. That you will be our beacon, our guiding light. That in you, Jesus, you are our hope. And that we can share that hope with others. Give us your wisdom and give us your courage to step out in ways that are uncomfortable to us, that are new to us. Guide us, Lord. Guide us. Oh, Lord, we, we pray that we can truly be your community of faith. And on this day of mourning, may your hope shine for all to see. It is with the confidence of your people that we join our voices everywhere together to pray the prayer that you taught us that guides us, that gives us direction, and that reminds us you are always with us no matter what. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
great God of heaven, my treasure thou art. Great God of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright and sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of Isn't that our hope, that Christ will be our vision and give us his sight? Would you pray for me as I pray for you? Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and our minds to hear the particular message that you have for each of us today. And I pray, Lord, that the words I say are not my own, but are yours. Amen. Well, how many of you have a scar? A few scars out there? How about at home? Any scars at home? Well, is it a pretty scar? You know, is it nice and pretty? Or is it one of those ragged, jagged scars? Is it an old scar that sort of faded a little bit? Or is it a new scar that's red and, and uh, raw as it begins to heal? Scars remind us of things that are broken, things that were damaged, and scars remind us of, of situations. I saw on Facebook the one did not too long ago where somebody in our church, their little boy fell and needed stitches on his chin. And they had a picture of it. And I immediately flashed back to when my brother was young. And he fell going up the steps and cut his chin in practically the same place. And I remember my mom holding the, the washcloth to his bleeding chin, and we had to go in the taxi to the doctors because she didn't drive back then. You know, you see something, and it just takes you right back to that situation. It reminds us of things that we've been through. Well, today, today we're going to look at, at hope in healing. And we're looking at hope and healing when we talk about healing of our sin. Now, sin can cover a pretty wide area. So I want us to sort of be on the same um, place when we're talking about sin. And so this is the definition of what I am using for sin today. Sin is those thoughts or actions that separate us from our relationship with God. Those thoughts and actions that separate us from our relationship with God. Our scripture today talks a lot about this kind of sin, the sin that separates us from God. It's from the book of Romans in the 8th chapter. Now, what I need to let you know is the eighth chapter in Romans is probably many scholars consider it the one book in the Bible. If you had to sum up the whole New Testament, Paul put it all in this eighth chapter. It, it sort of says why Jesus came and what he did for us. And it's chock full. It's a very dense chapter. And sometimes when you're reading it, you have to read it a couple of times. So today, I'm going to be reading from the Common English Bible because I think it helps um, 
make it a little clearer what Paul is trying to say. Those of you at home, you may be reading uh, whatever your Bible may be a different version. And so one of the things in different versions, you, it talks about uh, the flesh, the sins of the flesh. And the reason why I'm going to the uh, CEB version is that it clarifies, because I think that's very misleading. When people see the sins of the flesh, they immediately think about lust or uh, sexual immorality or things like that. But what Paul is talking about is our human nature, our sinful human nature. And our, and our human nature tends to be selfish and self-centered, right? And so uh, in the CUB, it talks more about that self-centered and selfishness. And so when you're reading, if you're reading at home, you have a different version and you read the um, flesh, just put selfishness or self-centeredness um, as we're reading. So I'm reading Romans 8, verses 1 through 8. So now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. God has done what was impossible for the law since it was weak because of selfishness. God condemned sin in the body by sending his own son to deal with sin in the same body as humans who are controlled by sin. He did this so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now the way we live is based on the spirit, not based on selfishness. People whose lives are based on selfishness think about selfish things. But people whose lives are based on the spirit think about things that are related to the spirit. The attitude that comes from selfishness leads to death. But the attitude that comes from the spirit leads to life and to peace. So the attitude that comes from selfishness is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law because it can't. People who are self-centered aren't able to please God. As we look in sin in this context, and we look at the sin in our life, we focus on that self-centered nature of sin. We all struggle with it. We all struggle with it. And so one of the ways that I want to focus on that self-centered nature is in two ways. To look at the broken places in our life and to look at reckless. Let's start with the broken places. Broken places happen when sin is at work. Sin breaks things. It breaks relationships. It pulls us away from people. It scatters pieces of, of wholeness. Sin, this can be relationships. It can be broken opportunities. Broken opportunities to go out and serve God, to help people. But sin destroys. It pulls things apart. It breaks. Sin is very destructive. And we know from the teachings of Jesus how we're to go and how we're to live. And the teachings of Jesus tell us that we need to be open and helping other people and sharing and living the way Jesus lived. But that's not the way of sin. And Jesus is it's pretty, you know, black and white of what we're to do. There's some gray area that we wrestle with from time to time. But when we follow the teachings of Jesus, it's pretty clear. Jesus gives us a moral compass that tells us how we're to go and which way that we are to go. The problem is it takes some energy to follow that moral compass. Sin, it's easier. It's easier to just sort of slide in down the sin side. But to 
go the way of Jesus, we have to be intentional, and it takes more energy. Do you ever get tired of that? Do you ever just want to stop? Or just say, well, just this one time, I'm just going to slide this way. It's a little sinful, but it's not too bad, and it's just easier right now. We all get stuck in that. I see how the broken places happen in relationships. Through the years where either as I worked as a counselor or in ministry, I met with families, marriages, couples, people struggling with issues. And it, usually what it comes down to is broken trust. And that becomes a scar that starts to wear on those families or people. That broken trust. When we think about that, how sin happens to come along and make things sound so much easier. But it is, it is Christ that calls us to be in relationship. Think about Let's say a teenager, a teenager that has um, started getting in the wrong crowd a little bit, started breaking curfew, not coming in, it's creating some tension in the family, and so parents are trying to rein them in. And so they have said, you must come, you cannot break curfew, and they promise, I'll be in on curfew. Because the parents don't really trust what's going on at night when they're not there. And so for 10 times, that teenager is there on time. And that trust starts to be built again. But what happens on the 11th time when they slide and come in late again? Do, do those 10 times get banked in the, bank, in the trust bank, they get wiped out, and we start all over again. Scar tissue starts to build around that mistrust. Scar tissue that, that hinders the healing process. As soon as it looks like backslidings happen, that scar tissue immediately flares up of, here we go again. It's not working. We're going back. And the distrust happens over and over again. If somebody's trying to really change their change what's happening, they have to, to lower the scar tissue instead of building on it more and more. It build to a healing point instead. Paul is reminding us in this scripture that it's our sin that breaks us, that breaks any kind of trust, that breaks any uh, movement forward that we do. Moving toward the relationships that God calls us to be in, moving toward opportunities that Christ puts in front of us, that it's sin that, that breaks those opportunities and keeps us focused on our time and our way and the way we want to do it and not God's way. Not God's way. And that separation from God starts to get wider and wider apart. Broken relationships. Well, sin is also reckless. I struggled with what word I wanted to use here for this. And I'm, reckless is, it's a strange word, don't you think, for sin? But what I was trying to get at is sin is all over the place. Sin has its own timetable, its own way of going. Whatever meets needs, sin is self-centered. And, and so it's reckless. It doesn't do things in the right way. And it needs to be corralled. It needs to be controlled. But it's, it's that reckless nature of sin that, that gets us in trouble, that we get rolling down a path that we can't get out of. 
Paul talked in our scripture about the laws of the Old Testament, how the laws were set up to, to help provide structure and guidance. But what got in the way? We did, people, because we started to distort the laws according to our own needs, our own wants, and the laws that had been established were torn apart and didn't work anymore and became a place of division instead. And it's those times that, that we see the reckless nature of sin taking hold. Jesus came to, to show us the way, away from that distorted views of laws that were supposed to guide us that we had messed up. And Jesus came to show us a different way, a way of healing, a way of hope. To show us that rules and structure aren't bad as long as they're ways of the Spirit not of the flesh, of, our, of humanness, that we're listening to God. Our hearts are open to God speaking to us. Jesus came to move us from this distorted world into the world of the kingdom, a world based on the Holy Spirit speaking. When we think about sin... Often we, we put it on a hierarchy, don't we? Well, I'm glad my sin's not as bad as their sin. Or, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't murder anybody at least. Anybody ever thought that? But sin doesn't have a hierarchy. Sin is sin. And there's a metaphor for sin that Sin is like a, a spider web, just where one line of that spider web, the first sin gets placed down. Not that bad, right? And then another, another line goes with it. And that we keep adding sin, just those simple little lines of sin. But in time, they build up instead of that little spider web, it becomes a rope that holds uh, a ship to the docks, large, cumbersome, that we get held captive with. Sin is deceptive. And without realizing it, we get pulled in. And it begins to separate us from God, separate us from everything that we know to be true. And we find ourselves swept along a current out of control. But there's good news. Did you hear the good news right from the beginning in the scripture? Paul says that we're found hope in Christ, that Christ has come to redeem us. Our hope is built on Jesus, not on our selfishness, our, our flesh, our self-centeredness, but on Christ. And through Christ, we all find redemption. Warts and all, scars and all. What's the word for that? It's grace. That unconditional love that God gave us through Jesus the redemption that was available to all of us on the cross. Scars, they mark us. Scars usually don't go away. You can always find at least a trace of it. We're marked by our, our actions, our scars. The key is, do we learn from them? Can we say, oh yeah, I learned, don't hold too many things in one trying to carry on that one. And oh yeah, I learned, make sure you watch where your feet are going when you're going up the stairs. And did we, 
Do we learn from our scars? Do we learn from the pain that we go through in life? Think about Jesus after the resurrection. When he appeared to the disciples, how did they react when he appeared to them? Did they immediately go, wow, it's Jesus, how exciting. No, they were scared, they were nervous. Who is this? You have doubting Thomas that goes, I, I don't know about this. And it wasn't until they saw what that they believed. Until they saw those scars. John 20:20 20, 20 says he showed them his hands and his feet. Luke 24:40 when he said this he showed them his hands and I'm sorry Luke, John was his hands and side and Luke he showed them his hands and feet the scars. When Jesus was resurrected he came back with his scars. And why? To show that human side of him still there. Because that's what people related to. The disciples, this idea of him rising and being a godlike was scary until they saw the scars and realized this is Jesus that we know. The man that we've walked with. We laughed with, we've eaten with. And they were comforted. They were reassured by his humanity. And each of us needs to be reassured by the humanity that we live, knowing that Christ died for us. And yet, our scars are things that we have to work through. And we use them. We use them to become his disciples, his hands and his feet on this earth, and to work and to bring people to a knowledge of who Jesus is. Our scars make us human. And our scars remind us that without Christ, we are broken. We are broken. So during this season of Lent, I hope that you will be doing that time of self-reflection, of looking for your scars, of looking for that sin in your life that maybe is sliding out of control, that is separating you from God. Where is it? What can you do about it? How can you learn and change from it? And then how can you learn, use that scar that you have in your life to help somebody else maybe going through something similar? It is God's grace that gives us wholeness and gives us healing. And for that, we are truly grateful. Today, as you're listening to Carlene, as she sings the last song, pay attention to the words. Where's the grace? Where is the hope? In Christ Jesus. Amen.
triumphed o'er the grave and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save his glories now we sing who died and rose on high who died eternal life to bring and lives that death may die So what is our theme for 2021? Tenth, hope in action. How can you be hope in action in the name of Jesus for somebody else? And how is Jesus providing you that hope? That hope that you need so desperately right now. Uh, as you go out on the pew, there is a basket. If you have not received your hope rock, I invite you to pick up a rock. That it has the word hope and put it someplace and be reminded of the healing power of hope through Jesus Christ for all of us. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and forevermore. And all God's people everywhere said, Amen. Amen.